Hi, this is Scott Dowdle, and I'd like to introduce you to the Mr. FPGA project. It is a hardware preservation for retro arcade, console, and computer systems. And it uses an FPGA. What is an FPGA? It stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. It is a board, uh, single board computer that has a main processor, RAM, and lots of input and output. And one of the chips that's on there is a FPGA, which has a large number of logical elements. And FPGAs allow um, a programmer to use a hardware description language to define hardware. And the logical elements on the FPGA will um, logically organize themselves to recreate the hardware that they've designed. And so FPGAs are used to design integrated circuits and central processing units and pretty much any type of electronics these days it allows someone to in software define um, a circuit a chip a motherboard with all these different components anything can be designed as long as it will fit within the number of logical elements that um, the FPGA is providing and so instead of having design a chip and then produce the chip and test it FPGAs are used for all the design and they can test it all out, make sure it works, and if there are bugs, they can correct those and make changes and add new features and do whatever they need to do and basically try it out and, and get the, the um, circuit that they're working on or the motherboard or, or the console or, their, or the higher level electronic um, device that they're making. And when they're happy with the design um, and all the bugs have been worked out, hopefully they can make ASICs out of it. Um, and those stand for fixed application specific integrated circuits and those are not changeable and so FPGA is the thing that people can design on to develop the ASICs and FPGAs because they have this ability to transform themselves from one second to the next to be um, one piece of hardware and then reprogrammed to be a completely different piece of hardware they're way more expensive than ASICs and um, they can be quite expensive the board that the Mr. FPGA project uses is made by a company named Terrasic and it's called the DE10 Nano Board. And here are some of the components that are on there. It's got a Cyclone 5 FPGA which has 110,000 logical elements. It also includes an ARM Core Tex A9 ARM processor that runs at 800 megahertz. Now dual core 800 megahertz ARM processor is quite dated these days. You might have seen one on a a smartphone maybe six or eight years ago it's not very powerful this chip the Cyclone 5 is pretty old um, but it is what most uh, ECE students learn in college they, they learn FPGA development on it so this Terrasic DE Nano board is made for college students learning FPGA programming the board includes a gigabyte of DDR3 RAM uh, one gigabyte Ethernet port an HDMI video for video out and audio out digital audio out it has a micro USB on the go port that you can hook up a hub to so you can plug in lots of different USB devices and it's got a micro SD card slot and that's where all the software goes now the card they give you with the board is a pretty small one it's only eight gigabytes but the board will take up to one terabyte card I use one 128 megabyte excuse me 128 gigabyte cards but they're also 256 gigabyte 512 gigabyte uh, I saw one at uh, Costco for a 400 gigabyte card and um, so you can store a lot of software on there. The cores themselves that they make up the, the hardware definitions for these different um, retro devices do not really take up that much room. It's the software that you want the large cards to store, especially when you're talking about devices that use um, CD-ROM images. And then it has several different uh, I.O. connectors for adding lots of additional things. It's got 240-pin I.O. connectors that get used for some additional add-on boards for the MISTER. So here's what the Terrasic DE10 Nano looks like. Um, here's the main Cyclone 5 with the built-in ARM processor. Here's one of those 40-pin um, I.O. connectors. Here's another 40-pin I.O. connector. Here's the HDMI connector. Here's the power in. Um, I think this is the on-the-go port that you would plug a, a hub into. It's either that or this one. Here's the uh, gigabit ethernet and you've got some other things some dip switches on here um, those are some dip switches and that's RAM that's your one uh, gigabyte of DDR3 RAM here's another view of the board 
here's here's the board showing all the components labeled so feel free to freeze that and uh, pause the video and look at the different components if you like and here's the bottom of the board that is where the micro SD card slot is but it's accessible from the side of it you don't have to flip it flip it over um, so what can it do why would you want to buy one of these uh, Terrasic DE 10 nano boards and run the Mr. FPGA uh, project software well the developers for the Mr. project have developed a large number of cores that's what you call a a hardware definition language provided implementation of an FPGA device and they've got many different retro arc, uh, retro gaming consoles to pick from several of which are handheld consoles um, a large number of 8-bit uh, 16-bit 16 32 and 32-bit computer systems and also more than 200 um, arcade machines with more coming all the time so what are some examples? They've got a core for the Atari 2600, so you can play all the Atari 2600 games. Uh, 5200, which has a much smaller library. And then lastly, the Atari 7800, which has an even smaller library. But still, there's quite a few fun games that are available on the Atari systems. They've got the Intellivision. Uh, I think I knew a few people who had those. My first console was the 7800 excuse me, the 2600. I never had a 52 or a 7800, but I did have a 2600. And then um, I knew people who had the Intellivision. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a ColecoVision in, in person, um, but I think it's very similar to the Intellivision so far as the quality of the games that it has. And here's one of the um, earliest consumer mass produced consoles for gaming, and that was a Sega Master System that came out prior to the Genesis. And it's basically like Sega's version of Nintendo's NES. It's, you know, an 8-bit system um, that had a um, hundred or a couple hundred games for it, all available on cartridges. And, of course, the, there's the vulnerable NES. We can play all of the hundreds and hundreds, I think probably maybe a couple thousand NES games that were produced. The Sega Genesis, we can play all of those games. That The, the Sega Genesis core is very good, um, pretty close to being cycle accurate for the audio and everything in the video and everything and um, it'll play the large library of Genesis games including the Sega CD games so it's like you've got the CD add-on there and you use CD image files for that and you can play all the Sega CD games it can do the Super NES which um, many people may not know but a lot of the cartridges that you bought for that actually included hardware add-ons in the cartridge in addition to the software that you know the game that you were buying so for example um, Star Fox it actually had a graphics processor in the cartridge and several other cartridges had additional hardware like additional audio chips and video chips and uh, processors and all that kind of stuff now not all all of the super nes cartridges had this additional hardware but a couple dozen did and as a result if you're in, if you're going to um, reproduce the nes you have to be able to reproduce all those add-ons that the games need and the mr core does all of that um, and then we've got the turbo graphic 16 from neck that actually sold better in europe in Japan, it was sold here in the United States, but it wasn't a really popular system. But it did have quite a large number of really good, colorful games. Um, I would say it's just a slight step up from the Super Nintendo so far as the quality of, of the hardware. So you've got a, a, a pretty, a really nice library of games for that. And the Mr. Core for the TurboGrafx-16 also does the CD add-on for that. So you can play all the CD games that they had for the TurboGrafx-16 uh, CD add-on product as well. And the Neo Geo was originally an arcade machine. Well, they decided to bring that home, and it cost a lot of money. Um, that cost, I think, about five or $600 when it came out, and it had an arcade quality um, controller on there you can see that's a, a full-blown fight stick so that was a very high um, dollar item and the games were very large cartridges and they were they were um, physically different than the cartridges that went in the Neo Geo arcade machines but they had the same software inside of them so you're actually getting the arc the actual arcade software at home just in a slightly modified um, consolized version of their arcade machines and the Mr. Core for this is excellent. They actually um, laser etched a lot of the, the chips that were in the original hardware so that they could take high 
uh, fidelity pictures of all the circuitry and reproduce everything accurately. And here's um, a little known gaming console. It's actually built into the monitor and you needed to use their monitor because this is a 3D vector art uh, vector game. Like if you remember the old Tempest, um, all the games that are on the Vectrex I think are like two color games. Kind of similar to um, the Nintendo what was that the virtual boy except instead of having this thing that you put over your eyes like goggles they had a screen that gave you the 3d uh, vector art now there is a playstation core this would be um, sort of the 32-bit era and the developer for it has been uh, providing his work in progress um, builds and usually about every other day or sometimes every day he'll come out with a new one that fixes reported bugs that people have found in different games. But that is so close to being done um, and so you can play a large number of PlayStation games with it just fine. And that there were supposedly over 8,000 games worldwide for the PlayStation. Um, in my collection I've got a little over 200 and all the ones that I've tried I haven't had any problems with. They've worked great including sound and video and, and all that stuff. Incidentally, the vast majority, not all of these, but quite a number of them have save options. So if, if the game originally allowed for saving, you, you, it mimics like the save card. And then it's also got save states that you can have it automatically um, save the, your game pro process, excuse me, your game progress as you're going through the game. So um, and some of them actually have rewind capabilities. There is a Sega Saturn core that's in development, and the developer who's been working on this, he has done so in private, and as a result of that, you know, no one's able to try out the core and see how well it works, but he has been publishing um, periodic videos that show how far he's getting, and he documents what features he's added, and we're guessing he's about 90% done with this, so we'll have to see how that I'm not sure how long it's going to take before it's publicly released, but hopefully in 2022 we will have a Saturn core. Um, the PlayStation Core, like I said, it's public, so anybody can try it and use it anytime they want to, even if it's not um, considered completely finished. But it should it'd probably be another few weeks or a month um, before they mark it as stable and it becomes part of the main um, software distribution. Now, there are a number of handheld systems that we've got. The Game Boy, the original Game Boy, which is a monochrome system. Very simple, but all the Game Boy games work perfectly. Um, we've got a Game Boy Color Core, and that plays all the Game Boy Color games. And there's also a Game Boy Advance Core that plays all the Game Boy Advance games, and they work great. Um, the developer who created those, he actually came up with a 2P version for the Game Boy. And what that is, is basically he's kind of scaled down some of the features, so I don't think they have automatic saves and rewinding and stuff like that. Um, they had to eliminate that, but the core provides two Game Boys, and you can play, two players can play side by side on the screen, either separated vertically or horizontally. Or if you have the uh, analog board that I'll talk about later, you can have a separate analog CRT display for one player and the HDMI display for the other player. And this basically um, lets you play any of the Game Boy games that had the two player option where you could connect two Game Boys together with a Netlink cable. And um, you can play head to head or team type games. And it works great. It's, it's pretty amazing. There's also a Game Boy Advance 2P core. And that, again, just like with the Game Boy, allows you to play head to head two players um, all in one system. You, you know, you hook up two controllers, and each one has a controller, and each one has a display. And it's got sound options so that you can have just sound from one system, sound from both of them, sound from one on the left side, sound from the other on the right side. It's very configurable. It's, it's just amazing how well that core works. Not to uh, say that Nintendo is the only handheld in the market. There's also a Sega Game Gear core that allows you to play all the original Sega Game Gear games and I believe those are pretty much ports of the multi uh, what was it called the Sega Master System yeah I think this is basically a, a portable master system and um, so I think that's part of the Master System core you can play the Game Gear games with it there's also an Atari Lynx portable and uh, the Mr. Core is very advanced it's got saving and rewind and all that kind of stuff and it plays all the Lynx games perfectly
And here's a console, a handheld console that the vast majority of Americans aren't familiar with because it was only sold and produced in Japan. It's called the Wonder Swan. And it was actually um, created by the guy from Nintendo who created the Game Boy. Um, and they had a black and white version of this console first, and then they came out with a color. And this was a very affordable, I think it was like maybe $50 in, you know, Japanese money um, equivalent. And uh, it could play horizontal or vertical games. That's why they have all those controller uh, control buttons on there. And um, we've got a core that can play both the black and white games and the color games. So it's, it's uh, pretty neat. Now there are a large number of computers. I've kind of divided these into the 8 bits, the 16 bits, the hybrid 1632 bits that are Motorola 68000 based, and then there's a few 32 bit systems as well. And we might actually see a mini and a mainframe here. Now I've only given a subset. There are a lot of pretty rare computer cores that I uh, have left out, like some Russian computers, uh, some Japanese computers. But the very first consumer computer that someone could buy, shown here on a cover of uh, Popular Electronics from 1976, was the Altair 8800. And um, it sold as a kit for about $1,000, and then later they sold um, ones that were already assembled. And it had a, uh, a bunch of toggle switches on the front and LED lights, and you had to program in the, the instructions and then save the instruction and you know program more instructions and your output was the LED lights and later they came with additional boards where you could plug in a keyboard and a display um, but the original was just all on the front panel that you saw there well the core that we have duplicates a, a visual of the front panel and you can toggle all the stuff and um, it's pretty interesting so you actually can try out the very first um, personal computer that was available here was one that was available, but only to a couple hundred people because Apple didn't make very many of these and they just sold it as a, as a board and it didn't come with a, a case or a keyboard or anything. And I think um, some people actually assembled this themselves, but we have an Apple One core. So if you want to try any of the original Apple Basic and any of the programs that were available for it, you can run them. And of course we have the Apple II as well, so you can run all the Apple II software. Uh, most of the software that you'll get will be files that represent uh, floppy disk images and um, I don't I a lot of the earlier computers used audio cassettes for storage and you can actually use real audio recordings with the cassette player and um, load that in and save stuff out if you really want to but most people just use discs files that represent the audio um, files we've got the TI 994A that was from Texas Instruments and um, it had basic and you could program on it it had a lot of games it is not quite as powerful as some of the 8-bit computers that came after it but we have a core that should do most of the software available for it the very first computer I got was this right here um, you can see the picture says Sinclair ZX80 in the United States I got the Timex Sinclair ZX81 uh, and it was the same thing just brought into the United States by Timex um, it had the flat chiclet kind of keyboard and it only had I think one kilobyte of RAM and I bought the 16 kilobyte expansion for it so I had 16k of RAM it only did black and white video and it did not do audio at all and only had uppercase letters but you could program on it and had some games so um, that's where I got my starting computers we've got a core so you can relive that and it never actually had a disk drive um, I don't think uh, it was all using a cassette tape um, Commodore VIC-20 was an early computer that a lot of people started with. Well, we've got a core that can play all the, the games, the cartridges and the um, tapes and the disc, floppy disks from that. We've got uh, a really good implementation of the Commodore 64 with multiple audio chips to pick from. And uh, so you can play all those Commodore 64 games. We have a, a very good Atari 8-bit core, so you can play all the Atari 8-bit. Here's the Atari, a picture of the Atari 800. My first Atari 8-bit was an Atari 600 XL, which is slightly newer than that, maybe by a couple of years. And they probably had about 12, 12 a dozen or so different models of Atari 8-bit computers, and that core will run all the software from all of those. Um, Radio Shack had uh, personal computers, and they also had business computers. The Color Computer 2, or the Coco. Two and Coco 3 we have cores for those the Coco 3 core is still considered in development but it will run a, um, 
quite a bit of stuff now, including a flavor of, of a Unix-like operating system for the Coco 3. And I think those maxed out at 128 kilobytes of RAM, the physical hardware, but the core can let you go up to 4 megabytes, I believe. On the other side of the ocean, across the pond, um, in schools, students were using in the late 80s, um, the mid 80s, the BBC Micro, and we've got a core that can run all of that original BBC Micro software. It works pretty good. Um, Acorn made the BBC Micro, and they made other computers after that. Here's the Acorn Atom. We have a core for that. We have a core for the Acorn Electron. Um, after the ZX81 Spectrum, excuse me, Sinclair came out with the ZX Spectrum that had color and sound and uh, more RAM. And it's a pretty, a pretty nice computer. We've got a core can, that can play all the... Uh, run all the software from that. Amstrad, they were a European computer manufacturer, so I've got a couple of these in here, but this one you can see has a built-in tape interface, and um, so I imagine the vast majority of software for that are images of cassette tapes. And in Japan, this is a Japanese computer, there was a standard called MSX, and various manufacturers implemented this, so you had Sony, and you probably had Panasonic and Sharp. A lot of different companies made in MX, MSX computers that met the MSX standard, which to the best of my knowledge was um, designed and done by Microsoft, so these all ran Microsoft Basic. Um, but this was a really big gaming platform in Japan, and there are just hundreds and hundreds of games, and the, the um, Mr. Core for the MSX works very well. Um, Acorn came out with advanced computers, and here is their 16-bit computer. I believe it uses a Motorola 68000, and it's Acorn Archimedes. You can see in the picture it's got a mouse because it came with a graphical user interface, and it ran something called, I believe, Risk OS, which is somewhat similar to CPM and Unix, kind of in between there and sort of DOSy too, um, but it was one of the early graphical environments. And um, Amstrad also made business computers, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but this, actually in the monitor, they have two floppy disks built in. I don't see a mouse there, so I imagine that was most likely a CPM machine or a DOS machine or maybe both. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I showed the color computer from uh, Radio Shack. Well, here's one of their business, one of their first business computers, which was the TRS-80. People call it the Trash-80 Model 1. Um, I believe that ran CPM and maybe later DOS, and then they had Model 2 and Model 3 that I think became DOS systems. And getting into the 1632 era with the Motorola 68000 comes the Commodore Amiga, and it had a, a lot of additional uh, multimedia co-processors on it and it was um, one of the very first super powerful video and audio production systems well the um, M at the beginning of Mr. comes from the M and Amiga and the ST and Mr. comes from Atari ST so that's the namesake of the Mr. is the Amiga and the Atari ST so we've got a very good Amiga core implementation that gives you a 68000 or a 68020 um, it has all of the custom stuff that's in the Amiga, and it should run all of the games and demos. I've seen videos of all the demos that people have come up with. And if it can run all that stuff, it does a really good job, and it is very um, cycle accurate. And, of course, we've got a really good implementation of the Atari ST. And um, there are disk images for most of these latter computers, uh, hard disk images that you can download that will have a complete collection of games and um, hopefully you can find some that has some productivity software on there. Now the Atari ST came with MIDI ports on the side. You can't see them in the picture but they're on the side over here. And MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface and there was a lot of um, high-end music production productivity software that was available for the Atari ST. It was used by a lot of uh, studio musicians and also for performances because MIDI can um, play stuff back live and also coordinate with lights and all that kind of stuff. And um, they have MIDI interfaces that I've got a picture later on in the slide deck here. So you can run all of the MIDI software if you'd like to. But the vast majority of people using the ST Core are running games and it certainly will run all the Atari ST games. Now, Sinclair's last computer before they went out of business was a, a Motorola 68000-based computer called the Sinclair QL. QL stands for Quantum Leap. And this was a computer that Linus Torvalds learned programming on and before he got into Minix and created Linux. So he's got a fond spot in his heart for the Sinclair QL. Well, we've got a core for the Sinclair QL, so you can 
try all the software out from that. And they did have some business software. They were trying to transition from being a games computer um, oriented company into, they always wanted to be a business um, software company, but unfortunately people use most of their earlier computers mostly for games. But the Sinclair QL was really designed for business software. Now there are some games for it, um, but the uh, application software is, is what they were trying to sell the most of. We also have a very good Mac Plus Core. Um, that is a 500, uh, 12K Mac or half a megabyte of RAM. Um, I think it can go up to four megabytes of RAM in the core and you can run all the Mac OS 6 and a maybe seven stuff. Um, anything prior to, you know, eight, definitely not any of the Mac OS 10 stuff. But a lot of the earlier software, and you know there's tons and tons of productivity software that you um, can use on there, and it all works. I've actually tried this. You can get hard disk images, or you can download. There's quite a few different ar ar archive uh, sites that archive all the older Mac software, and they don't seem to, to mind. You know, you can get a, f a, a really early copy of Photoshop and uh, Microsoft Word and all these programs, and the floppy disk images. All that stuff fit on a single floppy disk, you know. And, but you can get uh, hard disk images as well and um, play games if you want to play games or run productivity software, whatever. And there is a core called the AO486 core, and it is uh, a, an Intel 486SX compatible core. That means that you can run all of the um, early 486 software that didn't require a discrete uh, 3D graphics GPU. And that includes some of the earlier uh, FPS games like Doom and Wolfenstein 3D and um, oh, quite a few games like that. But it, you know, if you want to play all the older DOS games, like all the Sierra games, Leisure Shoot Larry, King's Quest, Police Quest, all those type of games, um, all the early DOS games work on it, and it includes MIDI support. So all of the games that offered MIDI music, um, you you can do that in a couple of different ways. Um, and they have a hard disk image that has the top 300 DOS games, and I want to say about 95% of those work just fine. It gives you a menu to pick which game you want to run, and you just pick it, and hopefully it'll work. Now, there is a, a crowdfunded Kickstart project that somebody got together, and they wanted to re-implement the Spectrum um, ZX, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in an FPGA, and give it more RAM and a faster processor, and um, they wanted it to be able to run all the original ZX Spectrum stuff, but they also wanted it to be a more powerful machine where you could write new software for it. And uh, I'm not sure how much that system cost, but I believe it was a few hundred dollars. But since it was based FPGA, they actually ported their, their core to um, the Mr. Hardware. So you can totally get this system as a Mr. Core and not have to buy it and be able to run all the software um, that it provides. Now we already had a ZX Spectrum core, but this allows you to run all the the next specific stuff in addition and That's you know where it has a different video more colors more memory and all that kind of stuff Now there um, are some pretty historic cores on here The very first video game that was ever made was called Space War and it used this display and two analog controllers and uh, you needed this PDP-1, which you can see is spread across four different racks there. And um, that machine cost a small fortune. And this display only did graphics. It didn't, I don't think, did text very well. It wasn't made for text. If you wanted text, you had a teletype type um, add-on for it. So you could type and then your output would spit out and be printed across the paper. And the core for this actually implements those two on the display, and they actually include the Space War game and some of the demos, uh, graphical demos that were um, part of that early computer. And so you can actually play Space War, the very first video game, and this is implementing the hardware, recreating it in FPGA, which is pretty exciting to make sure it's preserved for future generations. And Here's a computer from 1948 that was all vacuum tube based, and that's why it's so big. Uh, quite a few of those racks and those little um, bobs that you see, those are actually vacuum tubes. We've got an implementation of the EDSAC mainframe computer. Um, I'm not sure what software you can run on there, but uh, I believe it comes with a few examples and maybe some programming languages uh, that you can write some software with. Now let's get into the arcade machines. 
Um, I'm not going to list them. If I had a slide for each one, this, this presentation would just go on for hours because there are over 200. I don't know how many. There's probably 300 or more now. Um, but we get like a new arcade core once a week or a few times a week. Uh, not like every single week, but it, it's kind of staggered. And some um, sometimes when they develop an arcade core, it actually has the capability of running multiple games on it because later arcade hardware... Um, were no longer single game boards, but they they would ship with a game, and then once that became a game became less popular, you could change out the software on the board and reuse the board for different games. So several of the cores actually have dozens of different games that um, run on them, and they uh, get the software from the Mame project, which stands for Multi Arcade Machine Emulator, which uh, predates the Mister Project probably be by about 15 or more years. Um, the main project's goal was to preserve all the arcade machines by dumping out their software to files, and then they wrote software-based emulators. Well, the Mr. re-implements an FPGA, all the original hardware, and then uses the software provided by the main project um, to run on the FPGA implementations. And the vast majority of them are really close, if not cycle accurate, and if you had the original arcade sitting next to a mister, you really can't tell the difference. They're that accurate. It's just amazing. And the arcade cores um, go from the late 70s all the way up to the early 2000s. And some of them are, are pretty, pretty um, amazing. You know, some of the earlier ones, not so much. But uh, again, I'm not going to show pictures of all those because it would just go on forever. But pretty much all of the early early games are there, like um, Tron, Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man, Joust, um, Defender, um, Robotron, um, Donkey Kong. You know, all of those classics. And then you get up to uh, the Capcom CPS One, which has a couple dozen games on it I believe including Street Fighter, Alien vs. Predator, um, uh, Final Fight, a bunch of these games you may have heard of. Then the CPS 1.5, the CPS 2 with a whole lot of Street Fighter games including Marvel Super Heroes, uh, X-Men, uh, Capcom vs. Marvel and Street Fighter and all that and all the different Street Fighters. It's um, We just have tons and tons of classic arcade games including, remember when I was talking about the uh, Neo Geo AES console? Well, that was the original Neo Geo arcade hardware shrunk down to fit in your house, but um, we've got a Neo Geo MVS, which is their arcade machine core, and it can play all of the um, arcade games as well. There's not really that much difference between the home version and the arcade, but, but you have the ability to play both. They had different modes in some of the games. Now, the Mr. Uh, itself is mainly that DE10 nano board, but there's some optional things that you, you need to, to make to give you more cre creature comforts and make it uh, more usable. Uh, I would definitely recommend uh, the SD RAM board because some of the cores require additional RAM. And then the analog board is for anybody who wants to hook up uh, analog displays like a CRT um, or let's say uh, VGA or RGB or SCART or any of those types of composite even. And so you can run the original type of monitors that were used with the original hardware if you want to. There's a digital I.O. board that adds some additional uh, digital outputs that I'm not that familiar with because I don't have that board. The USB board basically straps onto the bottom of the Mr. and gives you uh, a lot of USB ports. You can plug in controllers and, and wireless adapters for various things. It's not required. You can just use a USB hub if you want to, but the board is basically like strapping on a hub to the bottom of it. Um, the JAMA board, if anybody has a, an original arcade machine that's got the Japanese Arcade Machine Manufacturers Association connector on it, you can just plug the mister into the JAMA board and the JAMA board into the original stand-up arcade and all the controls, the video and the audio should just work. And then someone's got a multi-system consoleizer, a board that you plug the D10 Nano in and you put it in this case and it looks just like a console and I've got pictures of all the hosts. So here's the analog board. It's got a VGA type connector and an audio connector and some buttons and a fan to help keep the Mr's processor cool. Here's the digital I.O. board. It's got some additional digital I.O. Uh, output on it. I'm not that familiar with that. There's the uh, Mr. USB board and all of these boards that I've shown so far are um, designed and the uh, 
schematics are available so anybody who wants to pay to have these made or you want to make them themselves they can do it but uh, there are quite a few different companies that provide pre-made boards that you can buy and that's what most people do is buy the pre-made boards here's the SD RAM card it plugs into one of the 40 pin connectors on the mister as does the analog board that plugs into here's the 40 pin connector here and here's this is um, put out because the, the memory card pokes up through there um, here's the JAMA board uh, again a D10 nano plugs in here on the bottom side and um, here's the JAMA connector it also includes a CPS1 and CPS2 kick harness for player for players three and four in CPS and excuse me Capcom arcade machine so this will plug into a Capcom arcade machine and give you all four player controls and this thing gives you two analog displays and one HDMI so it can drive three displays at once it's it's a pretty amazing board for anybody who's got an original arcade cabinet they can just plug the mister into this plug it into their thing and their uh, arcade machine is now two or three hundred arcade machines Here's the Mr. Multi-System Board made by Retro, RMC Retro, designed by Heber. It basically replaces the analog board, the USB board, and the SD RAM board. It includes all the parts on there, so you just plug the DE10 Nano into it. It also has a SCART connector for anybody who's wanting to do SCART video out. And this board, when the DE Nano is plugged into it, goes into this console-looking case that I'll show you in just a second. It turns it into a console. I've, I've ordered one of these, and I should get it in a month or two kind of excited but here's what most people do they'll take the de 10 nano then they'll put the analog board on top they'll plug the um, ram into the side here and then they'll plug in the usb board to the bottom and this is what we call the traditional sandwich layout and you pretty much can do anything any of the cores will work um, and if you want a case for that rather than having a naked case like some people have you can actually get a, an acrylic case or a metal case and um, the acrylic case costs about $35 depending on where you buy it and the metal cases can cost anywhere from $50 to $80 and they're often sold out and they're made overseas so they get them in batches and so there's periods when they're available and periods when they're not but the acrylic cases are pretty much available all the time because anybody who has a, um, a acrylic cutter can can make those and a lot of maker spaces around the country have have the ability to do that pretty easily and here's the case for that multi-system it's got two different tops to pick from um, a front and a back panel and then uh, a top and the two different tops are do you want to explore as a SCART connector or do you not this case right here on the underside of that you can actually put in a two and a half inch um, SSD if you want to use that for storing games and that comes in really handy when you're talking about uh, CD games and um, there's this adapter that plugs into one of the ports on the uh, DE10 Nano this right here plugs into it and then it provides this HDMI looking um, connector and into this connector they have made quite a different uh, a number of different adapters so it looks like HDMI it's a very high speed connector and it plugs into here and it provides in this example um, a port for an original NES controller and they've got adapters for original NES Super NES Genesis um, TurboGrafx-16, Sega Saturn, pretty much any of the original controllers they've got an adapter for. So anybody who has original controllers from their hardware, they can reuse those if they like. And when using the Snack, you have zero latency. You get the exact same speed as you do from the original controllers plugged into the original hardware. It's pretty amazing. Now, the regular USB uh, controllers are very low latency, especially when compared to software-based simulators. Uh, one company has designed a MIDI interface uh, add-on that you can get, and this will allow you to use this with the Atari ST to use all the music productivity software. It also works with the Amiga and the AO386, I believe, as well, because there were some uh, MIDI programs on there. Um, now, if you want to do just regular MIDI music, you don't really need these. These are only if you want to actually plug in original and MIDI equipment to it. Um, if you want to do MIDI music, you can use software-based stuff that you can run on the Mister or run on a network Raspberry Pi or a network computer, and it can send all the MIDI data over the network, and you can have it output elsewhere. Or you can get this thing called the Mister uh, MT32 Pi, uh, 
And basically it's a Raspberry Pi and I think you can use a full size Raspberry Pi or the Zero which is a lot smaller. The one in the picture here is the full size one. And basically this plugs into one of the ports on the Mister and you've got a nice MIDI device. It This recreates one of these original synthesizers from the late 80s called the um, Mo, the MT32 uh, that costs probably about seven or eight hundred dollars nowadays because they're um, were very expensive back in the day. It cost probably about three or four hundred dollars originally, and now they're you know pretty hard to come by because they're so old and rare. Um, but this re-implements it in software um, and hardware, and so you can just plug this thing in, and anything that uses MIDI music can now um, output the MIDI music because you've it's just like you've plugged in one of these MIDI devices. And there's lots of DOS games that support this, uh, Atari ST and Amiga games that um, have MIDI music options if you don't want to use just the regular sound chips. And it just gives a, a more realistic sounding music. And that's it. So I'm going to make a video that shows uh, the software and, and ROMs and all that kind of stuff for the Mister. But that is the Mister project in a nutshell. I know it covered a lot of stuff and I had a lot of slides. Hopefully you enjoyed it and you learned something. But it's really all about preserving the hardware so that we don't lose the capability to run the software. Thanks for watching.